Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real privilege and honor to be here speaking about my book. It's great to see anyone in the audience. So thank you for being here. Three years ago this month, I had an out of body experience in this cathedral. I sang a cappella in my native language of Igbo from the southeast of Nigeria, a song of praise to God upstairs. The event marked the day that I could truly say once and for all that I had embraced my culture, that I was proud of my African identity. For much of my life up to that point, I had tried desperately to deny it. To associate myself not with Africa and blackness with their perceived inferiority, but with Britishness and whiteness, all that was good and beautiful, all that was godly. Now that evening in 2019 in this cathedral was an event to mark the launch of Ben Lindsay's book, We Need to Talk About Race. Myself, Ben, rapper Governor B, and now Bishop of Croydon, Rosemary Mallet, one by one shared our experiences of what it's like to exist as a black person within white majority Christian institutions. As my allotted 10 minutes of speaking time came to an end, I opened up my voice to sing the first word, Imela. And my voice wobbled and I was taken aback by the echoes that reverberated through this enormous cathedral. I sang the words in my mother tongue that felt both alien and profoundly familiar at the same time. The words are something like this, Imela. Okaka Onyekerua, Imela Ezemo. And they mean, thank you, great and mighty creator of the world, my king. These words are from the Igbo language, my language, the language of great writers like Chinua Achebe and Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie the language of abolitionist Oluwada Equiano. Now, our people are a proud people who value education and learning and community and love God. Although the Christian gospel song Imela has risen in popularity in recent years, the words and the music sound ancient to me, like they are speaking to me from a long forgotten memory. Now, I've been here uh, to St Paul's Cathedral many times and walked past it countless more. And each time I'm taken aback by its sheer scale. It stands proud and large, peeps through the skyscrapers in London's financial district, an icon of the city. It stood here for more than 1400 years. What sights it must have seen, what change, what different types of people, what brutality. Now it stood tall through centuries of transformation and it stood tall while the nation engaged in the inhumanity of the transatlantic slave trade, bringing hundreds of thousands of human beings from Africa to Britain. Now today marks the start of Black History Month and so I want to take you back a bit. The present version of the cathedral was designed by Sir Christopher Wren, as we know, and built here between 1675 and 1710, and the period in which thousands of British families would have grown fat from the riches of the slave trade, or from the wealth created in the sale of sugar produced by slaves. Now, in March 2014, St Paul's marked 50 years since Martin Luther King had stood in the same place as I did on that night and preached a sermon titled The Three Dimensions of a Complete Life in front of 4,000 people. He had stopped in London on his way to pick up his Nobel Peace Prize. And five years after the visit, Dr. King's widow, Coretta Scott King, became the first woman to preach at St. Paul's. 
and the commemoration of Dr. King's sermon at St. Paul's coincided with the arrival of six steel figures created by Nigerian artist Zakari Douglas Camp to mark the abolition of slavery. The life-sized figures stood inside the cathedral's great west doors in a line, each a symbolic representation of a different stage of the slavery story. The sculptures were inspired by the words of liberated former slave William Prescott, who said, they will remember that we were sold, but they won't remember that we were strong. They will remember that we were brought, bought, but not that we were brave. Singing Imela in this place is a moment I will always remember. For me, it was a deliberate attempt to capture something of the beauty and the diversity of God's creation. To remember us in a world that forgets that we too are made in God's image. Now, I had come a long way from the little girl who would sit in my living room singing through each page of the songs and hymns of fellowship. I would belt out songs at the top of my lungs, such as Bind Us Together, Lord, and Let There Be Love. I was a bit of a strange child. Um, the orange hardback songbook was found in many a pew in the me many a majority white church in London and the home counties that I attended. These songs were representative of the worship music I had grown up with in the 80s and 90s characterised by church bands consisting of a bespectacled man on the lead vocal, strumming an acoustic guitar. There might also have been a keyboard and the occasional tambourine. In my teenage years, the churches I attended had decided that soft rock, with predictable yet enjoyable chords and bridges, were the Lord's music. These had been the soundtracks to my Christian life the lens through which I entered into God's courts with praise. I thought nothing more of it, save for the occasional instances in which I was exposed to black music, and something inside me was hungry for it. From the rousing choruses of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir to the new gospel sounds of Kirk Franklin's revolution. This music seemed to speak to something deep within my soul, and answer a call I did not know I had made. I sang a mela in that place because I wanted to open people's eyes to the beauty of diversity and difference within majority white spaces, where so much of the way we worship and live out our faith is monochrome and excludes so much goodness that we do not expect because we do not seek it out. I wanted the audience, most of them white, to see and hear things in new ways and be awakened to a God who's not only found in tried and tested ways, nor conforms to what the world believes about in whose hands divine power lies. I wanted to say that God can be found in the trembling voice of a first generation immigrant as she sings in the words of her ancestors and is surprised to hear them echo back. Looking back on that moment, what, what strikes me is the incongruence. Far too often the voices of Africa have been silenced. Its cultures and traditions and beliefs about who we are and who God is cast as primitive. My attempt in that small act was an act of defiance. The voice of Africa crying out to be heard amid the whiteness. For centuries, Africa has been denied its voice and its effervescent humanity has not just been sidelined, but rejected and destroyed. Its people placed into boxes with no room for dignity or respect. The white Western world has throughout the ages said of Africans that these are people not like us. And these people are definitely not like God because God is white. Right? Well, at least that has been the predominant image that I've conjured up in my mind when I've pictured God. God the Father uh, looks like Father Christmas, sits on a cloud far, far away from here. And Jesus looks like Robert Powell in the 1977 Jesus of Nazareth film. 
the most famous artworks picturing Jesus, from Salvador Dali's Christ of St. John of the Cross, to Holman Hunt's Light of the World, to Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi, depict him as white, with long hair and a beard. And this image has become the only one I have of Jesus, in consequence of having seen thousands of images of Christ represented in this way throughout my life. He does not look ordinary, but he definitely looks white. White Jesus is the logical consequence of a world that values whiteness as supreme. Unseeing and reimagining white Christ in the minds of believers is almost impossible. In a world where whiteness is power, then of course an omnipotent, all-knowing God must be white. God could be nothing else. But God is not a man, and neither is God white. So why is it that this is the image I and billions of others around the world, including my own grandmother, have of God in our heads? The image head of Christ might have something to do with this. And you may be familiar with this painting. It depicts an image we have come to understand as representing the archetypal Christ. It's Jesus, but with an extra dash of USA. He looks like he could be in a 1990s Levi's advert. In the picture, his dark blonde hair is wavy, his perfectly shaped beard and his piercing eyes are staring up at something in the distance. And there's a light of a lamp or a candle that illuminates the background, creating this soft glow. Now, created in 1940, this striking image has been described as the best-known American artwork of the 20th century and reproduced more than a billion times worldwide. Salmon's Head of Christ, as we have seen, is not the only depiction of Jesus resembling a white European. This is the form that's become most recognisable to people across the globe for centuries. Now, there's a long and complicated history around that, but the archetypal depiction of Jesus we see today is thought to have originated in the 4th century, during the Byzantine era, when the image of an enthroned emperor with long hair and a beard came to be the predominant way of representing Jesus. And much later on, this evolved into the more hippie-like Robert Powell representation of Jesus we see today. White Jesus is the consequence of a number of Western historical, theological and sociological prejudices that were so fundamental to the notion of white superiority that Christ could not have been anything but white. And one of the main factors, argues theologian Sean Kelly in a book called Racializing Jesus, is that 18th century German theologians argued among themselves about the ideas that, on the one hand, Christ was ordinary, and on the other hand, he was completely otherworldly. I remember my first introduction to the historic Jesus during lectures in Christology at university. As an 18-year-old who had grown up in conservative evangelicalism, I found shocking the idea that Jesus was in many ways ordinary. But placed within the historical context of first century Palestine, Jesus could be seen, um, writes Sean Kelly, as an essentially Jewish figure whose teachings were in line with those of other Jewish sages of the time. But those who wanted to downplay the ordinariness of Jesus and elevate his unique divinity subsequently became more anti-Judaism. Some theologians sought then to offer various solutions that stood Jesus apart from his Palestinianness and his Jewishness. This led to the idea that instead Jesus was in fact racially Aryan, set apart from his Jewishness and his so-called ordinariness. And so that's why white Jesus became a way of emphasizing Christ's divinity, as distinct from the brownness of his historical context. Images of Jesus became less and less Jewish and more and more white as Christianity spread from the Middle East to Europe. It wasn't until I watched the BBC documentary Son of God when I was a teenager 
as I properly took notice of the fact that the representations of Christ, so ingrained in my mind, did not reflect the historical reality of his probable appearance. In the program, anthropologist Richard Neve used a skull found in the region of Galilee to create a model of what Jesus might have looked like. Now, what they came up with was not beautiful by the Western standards we've been conned into thinking are objectively so, but since nowhere in scripture does it actually suggest that Jesus was physically different from those around him, we can assume that he looked similar to the average Galilean man of his day. And so we can accept that he probably did look more like Neve's reconstruction than Robert Powell. Robert P. Jones writes in a book called White Too Long, that the emphasis on a personal relationship with Jesus that is front and center in some forms of white Christianity only served to cement the depiction of Christ as white. While one of the main tenets of Protestant Christianity is this idea that humans do not require a church or priest as mediator in order for them to have a relationship with God, modern Western evangelicalism can at times give the impression that this relationship with Jesus is like one we might have with a brother or even a boyfriend. And as Jones puts it in his book, whites simply couldn't conceive of owing their salvation to a representative of what they considered an inferior race. And a non-white Jesus would render impossible the intimate relationalism necessary for the evangelical paradigm to function. No proper white Christian would let a brown man come into their hearts or submit themselves to be a disciple of a swarthy Semite. Over the centuries, God has been communicated as white. So what does that say about those of us who are not? What does it say about those of us for whom singing in Mela in Ibo in the middle of St. Paul's Cathedral um, make, makes us feel closer to God. Those of us who have to try really hard when we look in the mirror to see the image of God reflected in us. The first time I ever encountered God in my image was in reading a book called The Shack, the New York Times best-selling novel by Canadian author William P. Young. It tells the story of a man who, torn apart by grief after an unspeakable tragedy, encounters God in three persons in a shack in the middle of nowhere. God is represented by the Holy Spirit in the form of an Asian woman, Jesus in the form of a Middle Eastern man, and Papa, God the Father, in the form of a curvy black woman. Those who had read the book were careful not to give spoilers like I just have, but when I encountered Papa in the pages of the book, I was left open-mouthed. Because I'd never imagined God could be portrayed in this way. I remember calling my mum, who had read the book before me. We were excited and overwhelmed, yet also rendered speechless, because God looked just like us. When the Hollywood film came out a few years later, God was played by Octavia Spencer, who ironically had played Maid Minnie Jackson in the civil rights film The Help. Seeing her on screen brought it home to me even more. Here she was, a beautiful black woman playing the Almighty. And it's hard to describe what this meant to us. It wasn't something that we had ever called for, or campaigned for or consciously thought about. But there was something truly liberating in seeing, even for that short period, a God in whom we really saw ourselves. Now I'll admit this depiction of God also has its problems. In some ways, the Octavia Spencer God conforms to the stereotypes of a black woman in a white consciousness the loving, caring, strong mammy figure who comforts us and cleans up our mess. Thinkers like Christina Cleveland have critiqued the shack's perpetuating of racial prejudice, even as it attempts to free us from the tyranny of what Cleveland describes as white male God. A 
as she writes in God is a black woman. When black women are no longer confined to the number two or mammy boxes, everyone is free. Now that aside, why is it important for me to see myself literally reflected in the image of God as a counter to the narrative of who God is? Now if you'll indulge me, I might read a section from the preface of my book, God is Not a White Man, which I describe going to university to study theology, theology but with the ulterior motive of wanting to be a journalist. I recall one of my supervisors telling me that I wrote like a journalist and that it was not a compliment. And one of my supervisors is in this room, but it wasn't you, Maggie. It was someone else. Um, so picking up from the book, I write this. In this place, I had attempted to present a simple reading of theology as a series of intellectual arguments listed one after the other. This theologian thought this and that theologian thought that. Like the journalist that I wanted to be, I had attempted to take myself out of the story, achieving in my essays the goal of being that objective writer, a faceless observer. I had presented few of my own thoughts, feeling them to be unimportant and potentially distracting in writing academic essays about the nature of God. I have spent much of my life continuing to do this, making myself smaller, accommodating the expectations of how others want the world to be. While patriarchal influences draw a box in which women must sit and conform, white supremacy quietens the unique voice of the black experience. There is not room for both. Perhaps I should have listened much earlier to the lesson that my Cambridge supervisor taught me, that my voice matters not merely in the social justice or political sense, but because when it comes to theology, the personal account is just as important as the historic, academic or intellectual. So in the same way, my life experiences also matter. This is arguably more true of theological explorations than it is of any others. Since God cannot be seen or touched in a physical sense, we can only experience God spiritually and our inner beings, and our experience of God can then only be relayed through our words, our speech, a translation exercise taking place in which communicating our experience of God cannot escape being shaped by our histories, our social contexts, our genders, our racial backgrounds, our individual stories. It is these personal stories that shape our knowledge of the divine, how can God be revealed except through the variety of different personal stories, physical realities, and cultural contexts in which humans experience God's presence? The 17th century philosopher John Locke wrote, God, when he makes the prophet, does not unmake the man. It turns out that some people don't like it when people point out the whitewashing of God. In writing God is not a white man, some people thought that I was saying the opposite, that not only was God not white, but God is black. Let me read you one of the delightful emails that has been sent to me. I had a few. Um, right now, black people are being deceived by teachings such as yours. White people must be appalled at your specific, specious and spurious preferences towards your own race. I've been led to confront you because this mistaken and invented Christology of yours are as pernicious in their application as anything from another side forwarding white supremacy. You must realize the error of your way and cease from proclaiming God and Christ Jesus as being what they are not. Now, my problem is that most of my life, having grown up in the church, the picture that has been presented is that God values some attributes, namely whiteness and maleness as supreme. These are the ways in which God and Christ Jesus have been presented as what they are not. In my nearly 40 years of mainly white majority church attendance, I have felt in many ways other and inferior as both black and a woman. 
And in writing my book, I came face to face with the trauma of that and the trauma of the lie that the church has perpetuated over years about people who look like me. One afternoon during my research, I found myself sobbing. And there was a cry uh, that came as I read of the arguments that had been put forward by Christian men and women about whether or not black people were in fact made in the image of God, like white people were. And as I scanned the diagrams of the faces of black people alongside those of apes, I was reading about Charles Carroll, who in 1900 argued he believed on the basis of scripture that black people's destiny was to serve white people. And he wrote a delightfully titled pamphlet called Is the Negro a Beast or in the Image of God? The 19th and early 20th centuries saw a number of different pseudoscientific and religious thinkers arguing about whether or not black people were actually humans. Now, most of us would find it unpalatable to believe that the Christian faith ever found its way anywhere near such beliefs. And reading about the manipulation and the distortion of the Bible to prop up the most extreme white supremacist narratives made me feel sick, but also ashamed. Now, it's clear we have moved very far from such views, but what I think is there are vestiges that persist in both subtle and unsubtle forms. 1900 wasn't that long ago. And that sometimes the Christian story becomes so bound up with white supremacy and westernness that it's hard to disentangle the two. In many ways, we still hold up whiteness as superior and anything other than white as inferior. The past 400 years of black history is a story of brutalization and violence. And it's hard for people like me living centuries after some of these atrocities and an ocean away from the worst of it to separate ourselves from the cruelty experienced by those who have gone before us. When I read or hear stories of the rape of black women, the experimentation on enslaved black people's bodies for medical advancement, the whipping and the lynching and the killings, sometimes it's as if, it, as if I'm experiencing the violence myself. Monica Williams, a professor and psychologist, describes this as vicarious trauma. She argues that race-based stress can be triggered through viewing racial discrimination, brutality, violence or aggression through a third party, such as social media or watching the news, and suggests that racism should be included as one of the causes of PTSD. The thing is that vicarious trauma is both present and historic. When I see another black person killed, I feel it vicariously, but it also reminds me of the centuries of similar instances of violence against black bodies, those with whose lives I feel a strong bond that stretches out from the past through to the present day. Since Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968, the brutal murders of black men and women in majority white contexts have not disappeared. We've seen far too many social media hashtags containing the names of black people who found themselves the latest in a long line of victims facing violence, brutalization and death as a result of this pervasive white supremacist culture. These ideas that are in the air these ideas that render black bodies at risk. Over recent years in the discussions with fellow black Britons following George Floyd's death, I've noticed a common and familiar thread. When we watched George Floyd being murdered, we saw our own necks on the line. That sense of vicarious trauma that can cross the Atlantic just as it can stretch throughout the decades. Some wonder why it is that black people in the UK take it so personally when black people in the US are killed. And I believe it's because we see ourselves in our American brothers and sisters, precisely because we see ourselves in other black people everywhere. Close bonds form between oppressed groups in a way that can't be understood outside those groups. That's why it really means something when I see God portrayed as a black person not because I think God is black, 
but because it says something about the Imago Dei, the image of God. So we see ourselves in Octavia Spencer, but also in George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Stephen Lawrence and Rodney King and Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and murdered black men and women everywhere. The Black Liberation theologian James Cone discusses a painting of a lynched man left at the doors of a church painted by Hale Woodruff. It's an image called By Parties Unknown. If you look closely at the picture where the rope around the man's neck meets the ground, you can see that flowers are growing. Perhaps there is beauty to be found in the midst of pain. Cone writes, the beauty in black existence is as real as the brutality and the beauty prevents the brutality from having the final word. Black suffering needs radical and creative voices, prophetic advocates who can tell brutal and beautiful stories of how oppressed black people survived with a measure of dignity when they were not meant to. Who are we? Why are we here? And what must we do to achieve our full humanity? in a world that denies it. It's some of these questions around black dignity and black suffering that I explore in my book, which begins with these questions around the literal depictions of God throughout the centuries as a way into explore how society holds us less than. An omnipotent, all-powerful God represented as white what does that say about white supremacy and patriarchy in the world and in the church? White supremacy doesn't just come in a Klansman's white cape, but also in the subtle words that seem to betray these ideas that white is right. White supremacy can come not in literal chains and shackles, but in the narrow definition of what and who is beautiful. White supremacy can come in a lack of welcome to anyone who is not white. It can come in the form of monochrome leadership, theology and practice. In my experience of church, despite the knowledge that God is God of all, one might be forgiven for believing that our God values whiteness. White leaders, white theologians, white readings of scripture, white Western forms of worship are supreme. You might be forgiven for believing that God is a white man. But I believe the kingdom of God should be like the mosaic, a tapestry of color, each part equal and in relationship with each other. A Christianity that is more focused on maintaining the status quo of white superiority, as if whiteness is something that God sees as worthy of protecting, is not the Christianity of Jesus Christ. It bears no resemblance to the New Testament's critique of empire and religious leaders who see themselves as pious, yet ignore the plight of the outcasts, the wounded or the subjugated. As US Christian writer and theologian Nadia Boltz Weber wrote recently, the endless depictions of God as a white guy aren't just boring, they're blasphemous in their narrow specificity because God's image is seen and comprehended only in the mind-blowing diversity of all human forms. The wildness of human variation isn't a mistake. It is a sign of the glory of God. And yet we made it a sign for the value and ranking of people. Leave it to humans to take a gift and turn it into a curse. I want to end with a story that I think helps us recognise that each of us is made in the image of God. And it's a letter that I've written for my little boy, who's now five, and which is included in the book. You were two years old when you started to understand that the world was made up of difference and that people came in a variety of shades and colours. You knew far earlier than I thought you would that I am black and your father is white. I wondered if you were confused about that, whether it meant anything to you. 
I wondered whether any children had pulled your hair or excluded you or made you feel like you did not belong. I wanted to wrap you up in love and shut out a world that ever made you question your worth. When we asked you what colour you were, you looked puzzled and answered, Grey. Grey? Like an overcast day. And we knew right then that we would have to work hard to protect you from a world that might make you feel disappointed in yourself. One that might make you long for summer when your smile was already a sunbeam. You will always be our summer. So your dad told you that you were not grey, but golden brown. And your eyes lit up. You saw in golden brown your own radiance and worth. In golden brown, we saw the image of God in you. And God said that grey, black, white, or golden brown, it was always there. Thank you. I, I know that there's lots of work that's been going on actually for decades uh, around these issues and, and trying to update or um, edit or kind of change um, lots of the ways in which we speak about God across kind of from hymns to images. Um, I think it is very much, um, I hope that people understand that what I'm trying to say is yes, it's absolutely not just about the images um, um, that have existed for centuries but about language, about culture, about music, about how we approach people. It's kind of all of those things. Um, images are just one way in which we, um, which we kind of, kind of talk, talk about. Um, but yes, it's absolutely the whole, you know, including things like, you know, as, I, as I said, towards the end, structures of who, who we include in leadership, who we include um, as part of parts of our community, that kind of diversity of voice comes through in lots of different ways. Um, so yes, I absolutely think it's the all of it. Yes, and that I think so. I think for two reasons. One of those being negative. So I, I, I'm director of Theos, and we explore things including religious trends. I find it interesting that you know people aren't necessarily growing up with these ideas of what God looks like. And who Jesus is because they, they're not growing up with the church in general. So that's a separate point. But this was really illustrated to me a few years ago when I did a talk to a primary school. Um, and it was during Black History Month. And I asked them, oh, what do you think God looks like? And I expected them to say, Father Christ like Father Christmas. But they said things like, oh, I think God looks like a ball of energy. And I think God looks like a yin-yang sign. Um, and uh, recently a friend told me that their child said, I think God looks like a ghost wearing glasses. <laughs> um, and I think I have hope in the kind of creativity and imagination of younger generations, but also um, in some ways, the fact that they're not necessarily growing up with these preconceived ideas or images or um, this language about God means that their minds might be freer to imagine God in different ways. One of the things that I realized in writing my book or in exploring these issues is that there are some people who think um i some white people who might think i see god as white because i'm white um and assume that i see god as black because i'm black or a chinese person sees god as chinese because they're chinese and there are of course different ways across different cultures in which god is um, presented and the idea of the incarnation is that God becomes like us so there's lots of different illustrations but but my point is is not that there are lots of different ways in which God has been portrayed in different cultures across centuries as well but the problem is the pred predominant um, image that people have across the world of God is the white God and that might be even, you know, people like my grandmother who might have an image of God, Jesus or God um, as a white person, so someone other from us. And I think some people were surprised at that. I, 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 but I just wanted to point that out. It's, it's, the, it's the universality of this kind of white God that is the problem, not necessarily depicting God like the culture. Yes, so this is exactly the, the problem. So, so I think 
some, I think maybe because I wrote the book and the book is called God is Not a White Man, people assume I'm only talking about race when actually I'm also talking about gender. I don't think God is a man either. Um, so actually something that I went through in, in the, during the course of writing the book was myself choosing to no longer use male pronouns for God. And, you know, the first draft of the book, probably halfway through, I thought, I, I, I'm uncomfortable with this because this is, this is part of the point. So since the writing of the book and, and within the book itself, I no longer use male pronouns. And that, I've, I've, that has really helped me to start to unsee God as male. Um, and obviously that's, um, that's a long, complicated history of patriarchy in the church and in wider society, but also Bible translation, which tends towards um, male um, uh, depictions of God. But actually, the Bible itself is also, has lots of descriptions of God as, not, as, as female um, or as not male. Um, and actually, if we can kind of draw some of those out increasingly in our places of worship and in our kind of theology and what we write, then that, I think, will help to reshape um, these ideas of God as not necessarily a man, male. Now, some people might um, rightly point out that Jesus was a man, right? Jesus was physically a man. Um, and see, Jesus, I'm not, not questioning Jesus's gender, and um, Jesus came into a, the, a point in history at, at which, I mean, I don't think anyone would, would have listened if he was a, <laughs> if he was a woman, so there was a, you know, there was a point. Um, but interestingly, I'm working on a new book at the moment called um, Unmaking Mary, The Myth of Divine Motherhood, and thinking increasingly about um, um, Mary um, as in many ways, the mother of God and what, um, what Mary shows us about um, who God is as the counter to the kind of um, male Jesus. Um, so yes, absolutely, it's, it's really difficult. I find it difficult still to picture God not as a man and not as a white man, <laughs> a white man either. So yeah, it's absolutely both those things. I agree. <laughs> um, I think I think the ideal is that we do not. No, hang on a minute, I'm going to argue with myself here. The incarnation is obviously fundamental to the story of Christianity. This idea that God can be come becomes like us, just a slob like one of us. Um, whether Jesus was a slob, I don't know. Um, uh, something that can be touched and can come into our nests. So there's something, I think, really fundamental to the Christian story, which is about being able to imagine God and see God, not just this kind of nebulous spirit um, or ghost with glasses or um, whatever. There's something really important in that. However, I think what might be important is having lots of different types of images of God rather than one, which is white man. Um, so the diversifying of the images, I think, is important, as well as the thinking about God as, as um, beats the beyond, um, the, the thing that can't be pictured, the ineffable, the, you know, all of those things that God is. But Jesus has a physical form, um, and that, sh that shouldn't be whitewashed in order to kind of basically please um, more whiteness or white patriarchy. Um, yeah. I agree. The reality is that even if we didn't have any actual images, what is the society in, that we live in like? Um, so I try to sometimes think about, see, Islam, in Islam, you're not supposed to depict God at all. And I think, well, has that led to um, equality within Islam? Islam, I don't think necessarily, because the societies in which we live are also patriarchal and contain kind of white superiority. So it's not just about the images themselves. The images are created because of the culture in which they arise, in which they're created. So again, it, the both and, it's, it's the images, but also everything else that surrounds those images and their creation. I think it's really, there's something really powerful and beautiful when cultures depict Jesus or God and 
like the cultures that they're from because that says something profound about the incarnation and God becoming like us. Um, so I'm absolutely, you know, I would absolutely not be against that. I think there's, as I said in the kind of, speaking about the Shack film, there's something about me seeing God like me, um, which I think um, helps me into a kind of closer relationship rather than God being something that's someone that is far away from me. Um, the problem is when in those different cultures that are majority non-white, God is depicted as white. Um, and that, that's the problem. So yes, absolutely awful diversity of um, depictions of God. Um, it's when that diversity is um, not recognized, but God is seen as kind of monochrome white is the problem.